Thank you all very much. Thank you, um, Sam, for that incredibly gracious introduction, which uh, really means a lot. And um, it was a hell of a sandwich, I gotta say, worth, worth every nickel. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with all of you today. And I know Bob shares that. Uh, we're particularly indebted to the Stanford Law Review for putting this on. Donovan Hicks has done a terrific job. Uh, I have the great honor and uh, pleasure of being a lecturer out at the Stanford Law School from time to time. And what Jenny Martinez uh, is doing with the school is terrific. Uh, our mutual friend and research director on the Presidential Commission, Nate Persley, uh, has remained a lifelong friend and colleague after that. And it's a great pleasure to, to work with him and to um, teach with him. Um, and a special thanks for having uh, me and Bob here to talk about a project we've just begun called the Election Officials Legal Defense Network. Um, it is a bipartisan uh, effort to deal with sort of the tumultuous times from the point of view of election officials who Bob and I uh, got to know uh, on the Presidential Commission and have come to respect immensely. Uh, what we'd like to do today in describing EOLDN is to go back and forth a little bit in a conversation, ask each other incredibly probing questions, uh, and describe what we're doing both on the legal defense front and in terms of a community engagement project, because uh, I think we've come to realize through this that the, the way to help deal with some of the problems about the credibility of elections is really on a state and local level um, as opposed to the, the national level. But let me start out with just a little bit about how Bob and I got to know each other. And um, as you'll see, that becomes important as things uh, progress through the years. It goes back to 1982 uh, and a much forgotten recount in the House of Representatives, Hansen versus Stallings uh, out of Wyoming. And uh, Bob and I were on opposite sides of that. And really for four decades, we stayed on the opposite sides of some of the most contentious issues that have come up in that period. But I think it's fair to say that we both recognize the importance in getting better results for our clients in results that would actually be generally accepted and help heal after the contentiousness of what we were doing. It was true for the many recounts we were in, the court battles that we had, uh, the fights before the, the Federal Election Commission uh, on, on various issues. But that notion of being combatants for years but staying civil throughout um, has, I think, led to a lot we've been able to do through the Presidential Commission on Election Administration, and now, uh, we believe, through EOLDN. And Bob is the first um, probing uh, question. Um, let's talk a little bit about the setup for the Presidential Commission and uh, how it came to be, because you reached out to me and I'm internally indebted uh, for that. Well, thank you, Ben. I'm glad to talk about that. And I just want to just open very quickly by thanking uh, Sam and Rick um, for their uh, very gracious introductions. They're colleagues of mine at NYU, and I'm, I'm deeply indebted to them for hosting me at NYU, having me come there. I've been there now for a number of years and it, they provide just endless uh, friendship and intellectual stimulation and companionship. And I'm very grateful to them. And I wanna thank also, of course, uh, our hosts uh, tonight at the Stanford Law Review, uh, Dean Martinez and Donovan Hicks and his team. I think this has obviously been a wonderful conference. Um, the Presidential Commission on Election Administration, as you recall, was formed in the wake of uh, President Obama's attention to the controversy over very long lines in the re-election campaign in 2012. And in that campaign, of course, Ben represented uh, the Republican nominee Mitt Romney and I represented President Obama in his re-election effort. Uh, 
when the campaign uh, ended and all the and the election day occurred and there was a lot of attention to dysfunction on polling places and long lines that had occurred, the president uh, announced actually in his victory speech on election night that something had to be done about the problems that had been encountered in the polling places. And soon uh, the notion of setting up a presidential commission uh, began to circulate within the White House. I was asked whether I was prepared uh, to co-chair it and who did I have in mind uh, who would make an excellent co-chair. And without hesitation, I said Ben Ginsburg. I should mention, by the way, and I think I've told Ben this, that there was a bet in the White House that Ben would decline, uh, that Ben would refuse to do it. And uh, I bet that he would do it. Uh, because by that time, I'd really come to respect that even though Ben and I disagreed about a lot of things, and even though I knew Ben to be mostly wrong than right about those things, I thought that Ben was a, a, a an honorable, fine lawyer who did care about the public dimension of what we did. It wasn't only about winning partisan competition. And Ben did accept. And we did have a commission, 10 in all, evenly divided. But here was the key thing about it, which plays into the point that Ben was making about our respect for election officials. As we made recommendations to the president about the sorts of people that uh, he should consider appointing to the commission, we focused on those who had had ongoing intensive engagement with electoral administration. Those were current officials and former officials. And in what I thought uh, on our part was a bit of a stroke of genius, particularly given the concern with lines, uh, the head of uh, Disney Corporation's theme park division, which is, of course, famous for some of the most innovative line management techniques uh, on earth. Uh, and we ended up with an expert 10-person uh, bipartisan commission. And uh, it really rolled up its sleeves and it went to work. And I should just close by saying that uh, there are a couple of aspects of this that are notable. One is the report ended up addressing a whole range of issues and not just lines, because lines are a symptom of problems with the electoral administrative process. They're not a problem that can be attacked alone. There are all sorts of other uh, poll management issues, machinery update issues and the like that can play into long line problems. What we discovered, however, even within the sometimes frustrating confines of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and its transparency requirements is that Democrats and Republicans who come together can agree on a lot more than they perhaps imagine they could when they start. There are some things we had to set aside that were going to be the occasion for some disagreement, but the vast majority of what we needed to tackle, we were able to tackle on a bipartisan basis and with the uh, indispensable support of our senior research um, director, Nate, uh, Nate Persily, uh, produced a report that uh, then went into an implementation phase, funded philanthropically. Um, and uh, that, I think, was an experience that Ben and I had that encouraged us to believe that what we're currently doing, it can be successful. So that, that would be my, my short history there, Ben. I think that's absolutely right. There, there are a couple of points that, um, that we should add about the, the commission. I mean, one of the first was that Bob and I were really the only two political hacks on the commission and the rest were, were people who were in the trenches or had the business experience that, um, that Bob mentioned. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the magic things about uh, doing the presidential commission was that we actually got a behind the scenes tour down in the tunnels beneath um, Disney World. Aside from seeing Corella DeVille and um, Buzz Lightyear holding hands down there, with their masks off. Um, it was sort of a remarkable trip in the sense that one of the inspirations that we had for a recommendation, actually Bob came up with as we were uh, in Dumbo's Flying Circus, which is a ride for four and five-year-olds, but Disney in its brilliance has a big play area where they get to wait. So the inspiration was that, well, um, maybe that's what we should do with voters instead of making them stand in long lines, urge polling places to have places to sit and places to read while you're waiting in line. You get a number, you sit and wait. When your number comes up, you go. You're not waiting in a line uncomfortable. Um, and that was actually uh, implemented by a number of jurisdictions. So it was that very kind of practical, uh, uh, best practices, recommendations that we made that um, 
that was important. And one of the, the great things that we got to do in the commission was to meet uh, so many local and state election officials that Bob and I had, had met them before, but generally in a more combative tenure of representing our candidates and trying to get things in the way uh, ballots were cast and counted or people registered. And in the setting of the commission, we got to talk in small settings and large settings with election administrators to hear how they did their job. And Bob, I think we came away remarkably impressed with their dedication to the job and the integrity of what they were trying to do in a system uh, that, is, that is really designed to be a bit chaotic with 10,000 different jurisdictions. Yes, chaotic and also what we also discovered, and it's sadly still true, and it was on, in evidence uh, in 2020, that election officials uh, have to struggle with inadequate resources. There was a surge of support for what they did uh, after the presidential Florida recount and in the wake of the enactment of the Help America Vote Act. But since that time, uh, support for election officials at the federal, state, and local level is just woefully short than it needs to be for any number of functions. And they make do with what they've got. And they recognize, and we heard this testimony from Democratic and Republican officials alike, that at the end of every election, attention wanders off. And when budgetary priorities are set, those uh, budgetary priorities uh, typically don't favor uh, the administration of elections. And so uh, where they can have their polling places, the support they can receive through poll workers, the pay of poll workers, the availability of updated equipment, all of those uh, considerations that are so key factors that are so key to the administration of polling places typically fall victim to the prioritization of other things. And so when we talk about the value and the importance of our democracy, it's worth keeping in mind that we don't fund it nearly at the levels that reflects the rhetoric of support for it. Um, I was thinking, Ben, we might want to say a little bit more about, both about EOLDN as a kind of follow-on from that experience, and then also our view of expanding it. Um, as Ben said, we discover, we, we thought, and I'm, perhaps this has been touched upon earlier in the conference and other contexts, that we're seeing just an unprecedented attack on nonpartisan professional election administration. After 2000, there seemed to be bipartisan consensus that we needed to move in that direction, that we needed to view nonpartisan election administration as just a field of public administration. And that's indeed a conclusion of the report uh, that Ben and I and the other eight uh, authored and submitted to President Obama. Uh, there was no notion at all uh, that we wanted to see election administration brought more deeply into the middle of partisan political conflicts. That's what's happening now. And it's also intentional, it's purposeful. We're seeing attempts to uh, discredit election officials and to bring them uh, more closely under the supervision, if not the control of uh, partisans. Um, and this is something that represents a 180 degree reversal of, I think, the commitment made to the American electorate in the wake of the 2000 election. Now, a lot has happened in the last 21 years, but the pace of change is uh, alarmingly in the wrong direction. Our election administrators deserve better. Our, our, our EOLDN um, is meant to, and has indeed already functioned, to pair them when needed with pro bono legal defense when they come under attack, either through a state legislative inquiry that is sort of maliciously directed uh, against them, or the enactment of legislation that could impose penalties on them for, with vague provisions of one kind or another for what essentially involves doing their duty. And Ben and I came to the conclusion that we just needed to rally um, uh, people around uh, the notion on both sides of the aisle that this isn't permissible. And Ben, we're making an ongoing effort to expand even that piece with um, the advisory board that we have, which you might want to talk about a little bit because it involves officials and increasingly, we hope, lawyers. Yes. Um, the advisory board that we have for EOLDN is made up primarily of local and state election officials who help us understand the pressures that their colleagues are under uh, on the level. And we also have a number of, uh, of uh, retired practitioners in that. 
we are starting a legal advisory board for uh, lawyers and law firms who do come and volunteer their services. So the basic notion behind EOLDN is to match up election officials who uh, are either threatened with prosecution or are being excessively harassed with pro bono counsel. Um, we want election administrators to know that somebody has their back out there as they face these, um, these really challenging times. And I guess we should talk a little bit, Bob, about the challenging times. Um, certainly the 2020 election uh, was uh, different from any other election in a most disturbing way. And I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit because it's my side of the aisle that is, is more responsible for it. Um, but I spent the 40 years I was practicing law always involved in the election day operations of the Republican Party. And what that entails is having poll watchers and election judges in all precincts. You've got the ability to do that. Both parties have the right to do it. Um, and that's extremely important for being able to root out uh, the fraud or suppression that is sort of bandied about between the parties and forms the undercurrent for the, the dialogue that's leading to the pressure on election officials. And, you know, we looked really hard for every election that I was there for signs of fraud. Uh, and there was some fraud that got rooted out to be sure, but uh, there are 10,000 jurisdictions. So there are gonna be some bad apples, but there was absolutely no evidence of systemic of fraud that would rig the election result. And so when the nominee of my party, indeed the president of the United States, started making allegations about fraudulent elections, um, I knew on a very personal basis that there was zero evidence to back that up. Uh, and of course, that create, that those charges created all sorts of reverberations, including what's coming to pass on the election officials that um, were pledging to help. And Bob, I know you saw those um, charges from the Democrats' perspective, and you were integrally involved in uh, helping to set things right from the Democrats' perspective, which I think is worth talking about. Yes, I mean, we talked, we, we looked at these questions of fraud. You know, this is an ongoing theme in partisan conflict, the suggestion that an election was affected by fraud. And we've been uh, you know, fortunate until recently that, um, you know, it, 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 it not flared up uh, quite the way it has in uh, 2016 and 2020. And now it's become, of course, uh, if you will, a co-celebra on one side. And there are people who are running for office. Uh, on the Republican ticket for, in fact, election supervisory roles who are committed to the view that the last election was stolen and that there's fraud rife in the system. When the Presidential Commission looked at these issues, it didn't discount that fraud can occur. It didn't discount a policy objective of, of taking reasonable measures, measures that would be important to public confidence to protect against fraud. But it noted, as I recall, Ben, in the report, that impersonation fraud, which at that point, unlike mail fraud, uh, was kind of the rage of the day. That's what were the conversation centered at the time, that it was surpassingly rare. Um, and there's nothing in the significant research done then that has changed anything. One of the reasons that the uh, former President Trump's legal team met with astonishing and uh, pervasive failure in the outcome, in the aftermath of November 3rd, is that they were not only unable to establish fraud anywhere, uh, mistakes, yes, they could point to mistakes, but fraud, no, and certainly not even mistakes at any level that would question or bring into question the outcome of an election. But as everybody recognizes, some of the lawyers who were alleging fraud outside the courtroom would not, upon direct inquiry from a presiding judge, acknowledge fraud as the basis for their suits within the courtroom. So there was public relation focused on fraud and from time to time in retreat or otherwise, 
uh, much more care in what they said uh, the concern was on their part about how the election was conducted in 2020. Um, so, you know, we 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 have election officials now who you know basically stand accused of running an election in which fraudulent activity was uh, viral and affected the outcome, who are under continuous attack and. Our lawyer, the lawyers, and we have a, we've already begun deploying lawyers and pairing them with election officials, who, by the way, I should just say as an operational matter, are free to reject the lawyers offered and ask for another alternative, but they ultimately build separate attorney-client relationships with any of the lawyers who are uh, among the growing number of volunteers that we have. And so far, we've had success in finding lawyers for these officials who they find really helpful to them, sometimes just to reassure them that there's a lawyer nearby if things get really hot, rather than necessarily to take some action to defend them, say, against a criminal charge. Uh, some of this is just knowing that there's a phone number by their, uh, by their bedside they can call in an emergency or help them talk through a concern they have about a threat from elected officials. Um, Ben and I have been encouraged, Ben, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about the next step in the program. I mean, we are uh, very blessed that we have recruited a huge number of lawyers across the country. We're continuing to do so. We sadly have fought the need to be great, um, but have been even sadder to discover it's greater than we originally anticipated. And so we are signing up both law firms that are willing to make pro bono commitments to the Election Official Legal Defense Network, and we're signing up individual lawyers as well. We want to be able to move in every state of the union, blue or red, whether it's a threat from a Democratic or a state election official or legislature, it really doesn't matter. We just need to protect um, our election officials. And we are now looking uh, to expand uh, on another front. Uh, and Ben, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce this point, but it's really important to us. And um, I'll close this piece of it by saying, if you're here, if you're listening and you'd like to volunteer, we'd like to have you, but go ahead, Ben. Well, let me echo, let me echo that um, request for volunteers, which is certainly true. I think one of the things that um, we've uh, been surprised about is the volume of election officials who want help now. When we started the project, we believed that it would be um, a demand that escalated the closer we got to the election. Uh, but the truth is, is that election officials are really uh, put in a unique position these days and really as part of the calculated political strategy. So that has um, placed them in, in, in greater uh, harm. Uh, this is often a pro bono representation where the most effective representation will be something you don't hear about that the elections official just being able to talk to the lawyer, as Bob said, is what's really crucial. But what we're discovering and, and discovered as we started this project, that the problems of attacks on elections officials are really part of something much broader, which is the whole credibility of our elections being under unparalleled assault. Um, the most uh, striking numbers that come out of all these polls are that 30% of the population and 70% of Republicans do not have faith in the credibility of elections. Um, that is not sustainable in a democracy. It's something that um, a lot of people are trying to fight on a national level. Uh, certainly, if you listen to the to news media, read news media, uh, listen to the way politicians talk. There is a constant effort to call the big lie a big lie. However, uh, what's most striking is that the year since January 6th, the 13 months, the number of people who still believe the elections are not credible has not budged. And if anything has gone up, and so whatever the fighting the disinformation that's taken place so far, mostly on the national level, really hasn't worked. And it's, um, it's time, I think, to go down to the, the local and community level. Um, Bob certainly realized this, and that's the next stage of what we want to do with the Election Officials Legal Defense Network, which is 
to go in on a much more local level, state level and community level. Yet the leaders of the community all across the political spectrum, get them in the same room because the one echo chamber talking about the echo, other echo chamber, the red versus the blue is not working. But you have to have direct contacts where the complaints are aired. We want to gather those people in the community across the ideological spectrum with election officials. And the election officials can explain uh, in much more detail why our elections are accurate, why people should have faith in the results. And that'll be a conversation with people who are election deniers and election upholders at the same time. And that we hope through that dialogue, uh, on the local level to be able to have advocates for the for the accuracy of elections on um, on really a much more local level to fight that out. And I know, Bob, you have some real thoughts about the people who should be in the room for these sessions. Yeah, this is an attempt to really uh, mobilize civil society uh, in a way that does happen sometimes periodically. You can consider, for example, reports of how the business community weighed in when uh, former President Trump was trying to pressure the Michigan state legislative leadership into convening a session to appoint an alternate slate of electors. And there's evidence to suggest that Republican legislatures heard from members of the business community about the destabilizing effect of this chaos and that it made a difference. Uh, whether it's the business community with a very particular role that it has to play, the faith community um, aspects at the state and local level of the state and of the higher educational community, veterans groups, one way or the other, it is critically important that these groups who don't want to be drawn into fights over voting rights policy, nonetheless stand behind basic tenets, tenets of democratic self-governance. And by having this conversation and committing people as important citizens in their community to this enterprise, to this project, our hope would be that if things start to go off the rails in fall of 2022, or uh, God forbid again, in the fall of 2024, that there will be voices other than the voices of the two parties themselves engaged in communicating with the public about what's right and what's wrong in the approach to our democracy and the claims made about the democracy and the remedies that one party proposes to you know, cure its ills at the polling place, that's going to be just extraordinarily important. I've been very disappointed in aspects of how the civil society has responded. I don't think, frankly, over the last several years that the organized bar at the national level has performed at the level uh, that it should have. I contrast it with how it performed during Watergate. And I think there's a significant difference, and it doesn't speak well for our current times. But I think there's a lot of goodwill out there that we can refocus on an attempt to bring these civil society voices into the conversation. Ben and I are going to be traveling. We were in Wisconsin having conversations like this in connection with also our other aspect of the other aspect of our work, which is pairing lawyers with um, defense officials under attack. And we'll be traveling elsewhere in the country to have these conversations with community leaders and organize the discussions like the one that Ben just mentioned ago. Um, you know, Sam mentioned in the earlier panel uh, the notion that when other uh, foreign countries sort of went up on the brink uh, with uh, at least the uh, problems with the validity of their elections, the business community played a major role uh, along with center-right uh, governance and, and institutions in bringing the country back to an acceptable level. And um, I was really struck by that because that is in large part the notion behind what we want to do with the, the community activism civil society um, project. It is vitally important for us to be able to get the business community involved at the local level, religious leaders involved, educators, um, uh, associations, the, the, the basic folks who make a local community run. And by getting them invested 
in the accuracy of election is really important. And as Sam pointed out, um, it's bad for business if, <laughs> if our democracy is falling apart because people don't have faith in elections. Um, and part of what we recognize is the backdrop is sort of the constant drumbeat of legislation in states that are causing greater problems for the credibility of elections. And indeed, in some cases, Bob criminalizing the activities of election officials. You know, that's ab absolutely right. And so at various there, these interventions uh, by voices within the community can occur at a lot of places. It can occur in the consideration of legislation of the kind Ben just mentioned that proposes to it, put election officials at risk of criminal prosecution for doing their jobs. It can be heard at the moment that legislatures authorize, uh, for want of a better term, I don't know any way to put it gently, uh, sham audits like the one that the so-called cyber just conducted in the state of Arizona and that other legislatures, including one currently in Wisconsin, uh, are considering unleashing uh, on the 2020 election, somehow showing that the votes weren't counted accurately, but driving toward that conclusion by appointing people who are both partisan, convinced that the election was stolen, and unqualified to perform audits. Um, and so the legislatures need to be heard on this, um, uh, need to hear from these voices on this. Legislatures need to hear, elected officials elsewhere need to, be, to hear about this. There just needs to be an attempt, again, uh, to have people speak who are not the authorized representative of the competing political parties, which I think oftentimes uh, voters just tune out. They just hear these cross-cutting claims and they discount them. So that's the next phase in our effort. And I, I, I would I just I want to add this other point that Ben and I wanted to cover today, and that is we both live in a world in which people think any suggestion or reference to bipartisanship is folly. There isn't such a thing. The stakes are existential. The two parties are sharply divided over matters that they think are simply uh, irreparably or undilutedly consequential. Uh, and so only someone who's naive thinks that communication can occur across the aisles. Ben and I don't agree on a lot of things still today. I'm sure that if Ben and I sat down and thought through the best design of a constitutional voting system in the state, you know, I might come up with views that are different from his views. My views might align more with my party's views on certain aspects of voting rights reform than his views would. But we're not talking about bipartisan, sort of naive thoughts about bipartisan agreement of that kind. Although, by the way, there are areas in voting rights reform where bipartisanship might be possible. We're talking about bipartisanship around fundamental defense of democratic institutions. And there I do think, and I think Ben and I have discovered, uh, that there is room for that. And it just needs to be cultivated and worked really hard. And that's what we're committed to doing. Yeah, and there are some specific things. One of the, there's a very good question in the chat about are there particular states or types of communities where we're seeing particular high rates of threats and need for protection? And the answer um, has actually surprised us a bit. For certain, the what, what would be considered the presidential battleground states um, are those states, the, the Georgias and the Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, Arizona uh, are, are, are really the center for that. Um, but it's also come in sort of more surprising places where um, a local official will decide it is imperative for the future of the democracy to impound voting machines. And um, the election officials know that they're not permitted by law to do that, yet the local prosecutor is banging on their door. And so it is, uh, I think our work will be concentrated in the presidential battleground states of 2020, but it's also going to be in some surprising places uh, in states where political control is uh, complete on the local level, but not necessarily statewide. So this is a, a, a phenomenon that's spreading beyond traditional political battlegrounds, which make it, um, which um, 
make it kind of even more important that we pay a lot of attention. And there are also laws being undertaken uh, in, in um, legislatures where there's one party control uh, between the legislature and the governorship. And they really fall into three categories that we're particularly concerned about. Um, one is one, uh, there are a few states that have tried to criminalize the actions of election officials. We're on particularly um, high alert for, for those. That's the Georgias and the Arizonas and the Texases. <clears throat> um, there are uh, a couple of states that appear to be trying to set up the determination of the final winner of elections under legislative control. The movement, <coughs> excuse me, of, of tabulating votes from the pros and election administration to the pals. And that's potentially a very dangerous phenomenon in terms of subverting the, um, the votes of the people. And thirdly, there are a few states that are uh, weaponizing what poll watchers in polling places may be able to do. And in that instance, we're worried about um, not only the pressure on election administrators, but also um, how it can disrupt the, the polling place as, as a whole. So those are the states that, that are passing and considering that in this legislation, in this legislative session that particularly um, has our attention. And Bob, can you talk a little bit about the protections that you see um, coming up around the country to be able to deal with these laws? Uh, in, 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 are you talking about like legal action that's being taken? Yeah, or? legal actions that are being taken. There's certainly, by the way, well, this, this, by the way, may help us segue a little bit into a, a, a final topic, and I'm going to rely on our, our moderators to tell us when we ought to be stopping here and opening it up for questions, which we're obviously happy to do. Um, we, there has been more focus on so-called anti-election subversion, uh, distinguished from other disagreements between the two political parties about what we call voting access rules. And there is some discussion currently taking place in connection with the Electoral Count Act reform efforts in Congress about potentially including in any Electoral Count Act reform a federal level mandates for the protection of election officials. Um, so that is something that may or may not develop. It may be that ECA reform proceeds without that. It may be that becomes part of the ECA reform debate. Um, it may also be that if it doesn't wind up being part of the ECA reform debate in the end, that there'll be enough discussion of it that uh, there'll be on ongoing federal level attention to what it means to protect democracy by uh, protecting those who are uh, administering um, uh, the, the polling places. Clearly, when um, some of these statutes uh, that are being passed that result in some pending looming threat, sort of Damocles threat against these election officials, if there is some attempt uh, on the part of um, states to move toward the application of those provisions. For example, there are provisions in some laws that hold um, elect uh, election officials responsible for conduct as vague as hindering or disregarding the object of the law. Now, there clearly will be uh, legal pushback. There clearly will be litigation. Um, and uh, indeed, there should be, uh, because they can't function in an environment where something that in specific is held out against them. And um, the threat may be, the threat alone is bad enough, uh, but the implementation of the threat in particular circumstances could be absolutely devastating. So there's certainly readiness to resort to legal defenses against that sort of behavior. And also a debate, as I mentioned, at the um, federal legislative level. Um, but is, uh, before we wrap up our piece, is it worthwhile taking a few minutes, Ben, or just a couple of minutes here to talk about ECA reform? Yeah, I think we should. But one of the really interesting things about uh, ECA reform is that it is an opportunity for some bipartisan agreement uh, in the election law area. And uh, that's for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, is that uh, 
no one can read this law and say it is a crystal clear distillation of what uh, the country or Congress should do in what will be a time that will incredibly stress test um, all of our all of our systems. So uh, anybody who's watching the Gilded Age uh, on TV these days knows that they talked a little bit different back in the 1880s, and that's reflected in this law, and it should be modernized to make clear what would happen. But the second reason that I think it's ripe for reform is that nobody can quite game out how they, how they can game out the, the ECA, because there are too many variables. You don't know who the vice president is, or which party. Um, and you don't know which party will be ahead in the makeup of the new Congress. So there are provisions where ECA would throw it to the House of Representatives to determine the president, but it's not by numbers, it's by state delegations. So each state gets a vote, Wyoming gets one, California gets one, whoever the representative from Wyoming is, can um, swing uh, her delegation however she wants. So it is a different system where it, it, it is much harder to game than redistricting bills or uh, uh, election law bills or voting rights bills. Um, the other part of it is that I, I think it breaks down to three areas where there will be um, pretty easy to get bipartisan reform which is the role, the role of the vice president. Uh, I think Mike Pence was absolutely right about uh, how much uh, authority the vice president has. Uh, I think that can be written cl more clearly in the law. Um, I think the threshold for objections to uh, a state's delegation is now just one senator and one representative, and that can be increased to 20% of each body, a third of the body, majority of the body. And I don't think there'll be much um, ultimate controversy over that. And then there needs to be some sort of a safe gap <clears throat> for the failure to actually hold an election. A hurricane uh, blows through a part of the state. And there will be some discussion over how many days it should be held open and whether it should be the entire state that gets to keep voting or just an affected portion, and then who can declare what amounts to the, the state of emergency. But then there are a series of provisions that will be much, much tougher. And it's a little bit of um, a tug of war between Congress and the states and then whether the federal judiciary should play a role. And so, um, you know, to pass ECA reform, it's, it's going to be uh, the Congress that is gonna to have to say either they wanna be a national recount board or they don't wanna be a national recount board. Uh, and Bob, what I think I'm seeing right now is that Congress most of Congress recognizes more or less they shouldn't be a national recount board, but I don't think that's even that's universal at the moment. No, Congress is uh, over time, and I mean, obviously the 1876 election is an example, but there are plenty of other examples. ECA reflects it. The current electoral count act reform reflects a congressional judgment. I'm not saying it's a constitutional judgment. I'm not saying it's a practical or prudential judgment that it can intervene where necessary. Uh, to police uh, an election that has gone awry in some way. Uh, typically, of course, the, the claim that it confronts is that the election uh, was fraudulent and the popular vote reported by the states didn't reflect the real popular will of the public. Um, so Congress has a long history of sort of, if you will, lying in the tall weeds, ready to assert that claim. I think there is general bipartisan agreement that whether it's a constitutional question or a prudential question or a combination of both, that's not a role that Congress uh, should play. Uh, now, you're right, I, I think Ben is absolutely correct. The tension of course is that uh, when a problem like that is being solved, the desire is to have the solution be grow global. And if Congress is not going to step in and um, be, if you will, the ultimate decider in matters of really high controversy that are affected 
uh, by a highly, highly polarized, divided politics. And the question is, who will? And we've just been talking about some of the behavior of state legislatures that wouldn't give anybody any confidence uh, that they should be playing that role. But then there are all sorts of constitutional complications, including uh, the constitutional authority of state legislators under Article II uh, to appoint uh, electors, um, to establish the manner of appointing electors and the scope of that authority and uh, what it means for what Congress can or cannot do. And it has been suggested what that means for Congress's ability, for example, to call on the federal courts to play a role. You know, all of that is part of a very, very uh, complicated set of questions that in many respects, though being discussed in connection with ECA reform, hasn't floated to the surface of the debate in the way that, say, the authority of vice presidents or raising the objection threshold has. That isn't, I won't say that's low-hanging fruit because those questions are, are not uncomplicated, but um, at the same time, uh, they, they don't give you a real feeling for the interconnectedness of some of these issues uh, and for the complexity of some of these issues. But there's at least a recognition, A, that there's a problem, uh, and B, that there needs to be some bipartisan discussion about how to do solve that problem. And uh, there is a bipartisan group around Senator Collins who's working on it. There's a bill that I think uh, Senators King, Durbin, and Klobuchar intend to draw bipartisan support and inform what the Collins group is doing. And uh, similarly, there are efforts in the House of Representatives, uh, at least on the Democratic side, to produce work that could eventually at least command bipartisan support. So we have a long road to go, but th there's no question that there's probably no more indispensable reform effort of this nature. Um, you know, now that we have, for the time being, clearly reached a standstill on freedom to vote or HR1, and I'm not minimizing the significance of those debates or those bills, but we're now facing a real fundamental choice um, against the backdrop of what happened on January 6. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, in terms of what I think the most interesting and probably uh, contentious issue will be is going to be the role of the federal courts in sorting through the different, um, the different scenarios of when um, slates of electors come from the states. And that's really the push versus shove um, moment. What's most interesting in speaking of the bipartisanship that Bob so rightly notes is that it is not a clear Republican versus Democrat breakdown right now about what the role the federal court should play. But I do think that solving the role of the courts and what they can do in, in, in dealing with uh, slate issues will be the key to unlocking the, the electoral count act reforms. Um, with that, Bob, uh, as always, it has been uh, a huge pleasure to work with you and discuss these issues with you. And um, we're certainly happy to take any questions. Uh, Emma, do you want us just to read them out of the chat or will you all uh, read them to us? It's the... um, if you don't mind reading them out, I sent them all to you. Um, so that would be that would be great. But I'm also happy to hop on and ask each one if you prefer that. Well, this means I can talk and walk and chew gum at the same time, which um, we it's an open question. Yeah, it's, it's, an open, open it's an open question. You're more than welcome to take over this role, Bob. Um, <laughs> are there particular states or communities where we're seeing higher rates of threats and need for protection? I guess the advantage of me reading the questions is you get to answer them. Well, we actually, we, I think you earlier did address that yeah. question. Uh, so you can go on to the next one. What are the least explored and most important issues of election law right now? Um, you know, I think this tumultuous time is actually um, putting some focus on the one I would have picked, which is the decentralization of, um, of our election system. I mean, it is in, in, when you get down to recounts and contests, what you look for is, did each individual in the relevant jurisdiction have the same opportunity to vote? And inevitably, when you have 10,000 different jurisdictions and multi-jurisdictions in every state, that's gonna be a problem. Uh, human nature being what it is, 
the volunteer uh, uh, based system that we have means there's not going to be perfect consistency. And if there's a more long term sort of thought, thought bubble that I hope emerges from um, what we're seeing now, it's that we take another look at election administration, realize the, the central rule belongs to the states, but also that if you have multiple jurisdictions, you're not going to give all the citizens of that jurisdiction uh, precisely the same ability to have their votes cast and counted. Do you have any other pet favorites, Bob? Uh, no. Um, if I read the question, I mean, the least explored, the most important issue of election law right now, I, I would say, just to put a marker in it, that there's some basic blocking and tackling that uh, just doesn't get the same attention that other election uh, protection issues do, like funding our elections appropriately. Um, so the administration is in a position to do a good job so that errors made don't give rise to fears of fraud. Uh, and I worry that um, because it doesn't command the headlines, uh, that it will also not drive a reform effort and certainly a funding effort in the way that it should at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, but, you know, that's probably a view that's been, first of all, I think it's a view many election officials share, and it's certainly a view we came to when we were on the presidential commission. Yeah, um, we've heard throughout this symposium that there's a basic disagreement about what the right to vote is. How is any legal fix a solution to what seems to be an ir irreconcilable political difference? Well, I think this is one thing, first of all, there isn't, let me say one thing that I, I don't wanna be misunderstood saying it. There are all sorts of legal fixes to pieces of the overall problem that we face confronting the democracy. But, and as we just debated the whole con conception of norms repeatedly over the last several years, but um, if there is a complete collapse of respect for democratic norms and bad faith all around, uh, there is a limit uh, to what legal reform can do. Legal reform is essential. There are certain, as I said, problems that could be addressed through well-crafted legal reform. An example of that would be reform of the Electoral Count Act. An example of that would be the enactment of uh, protections for election officials. But um, none of that can survive a fundamental collapse of confidence in democratic institutions or, and related to that, the belief on, certain, on the part of political actors um, that it is no longer acceptable in a democracy to lose. And therefore, if you are in the verge of losing, that you have to prepare to, if you will, take it back, uh, probably covering your tracks by alleging that you actually won when in fact it appears that you lost. And if we're in that world, um, uh, and we can always spin out the hypotheticals, we're gonna be in, you know, we're gonna be in, in really significant, if not fatal trouble. But uh, that doesn't mean that the pursuit of legal reform is un unimportant. I think it's very important. And it can also have an effect, by the way, if there's bipartisan legal reform of reviving the norms and communicating them more effectively to a broader public. And so I don't think there's a sharp line between legal reform and attention, for example, to what we were talking about earlier, which is the importance of civil society to alerting the public to what are the guardrails of the democracy. But um, uh, these irreconcilable political differences cannot ultimately doom some common acceptance of what participation in a democratic polity requires. And if it does, there's no law on earth that's going to be able to do anything about that. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right, which is why this next uh, question seems right as a perfect follow up. Both of you have an unending faith in our legal institutions to keep our democracy intact. Have events of 2020 and 2021 diminished that faith at all? Um, I'll take the first crack at that. So the answer, the answer is a little bit of both. Um, look, the, the events of 20 and 21 um, should shake us all a great deal and show us just how much attention we have to pay. Uh, what the events of 2020 
showed us is that even in an unprecedented time, um, both because of the pandemic and because of the Trumpian charges, the system held and performed uh, as it should have. And so that tells us um, just how strong the legal institutions are. Uh, legal institutions and the norms and values that Bob mentioned are getting challenged as never before. Um, but you know, this is a case of if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. And what I do believe is that we're seeing <coughs> uh, a, a, a real effort to deal with these problems that have been raised and to correct them. So what we've seen with the, the EOLDN uh, is really a tremendous outpouring of volunteer help uh, from the legal community to help elections officials who, while many of them are leaving the profession, the ones who are staying recognize even more so how important that, that job is. And so I would say at this point, um, my faith is not diminished, but uh, we all have to fight a great deal to, to keep it up high. I agree with oh, that. You, you get this one, Bob. If you were able to substitute one reform nationwide, what would it be? Well, that, that, that is a really, really difficult question. I mean, I'd like to dodge it by coming up with some kind of omnibus reform bill that has all different pieces in it that I think are really important. Um, so it's, you know, it, it, it's really difficult to answer that question because I think a assumption behind the question might be that there is one particular reform that would have some sort of transformative effect on the functioning of democratic institutions. And I don't know that that is the case. I think it is an all systems approach. And so I have to say that I can think of all sorts of things I think should happen that would be priorities but it wouldn't be one thing. And I, we've talked about some of them. I mean, I just have to come back to something again. The absolute uh, disgraceful neglect of the fundamental electoral infrastructure in this country is something we just, you know, I don't know, it doesn't seem to be something that grabs people's attention. Uh, but, you know, we ought not to be in a position where supplies are running out, machinists, third generation, poll workers are, you know, in the older cohort, um, and there are huge strains on them to keep up with the long days uh, that are required to man polling places. Pay for them is inadequate. Uh, I mean, I can just run down the whole list, but we thought at the Presidential Commission reporting in 2014 that the government ought to treat its voters the way our best businesses treat their customers. And the government doesn't treat its voters that way. Now, I think that has a lot to do with voting access. I think if the, if the polls are, there are all sorts of problems with access to the polls. And as a Democrat, I have strong views about what are the best policies for early voting, automatic registration, same day registration, all of that. But having, having said all of that, a guarantor of access, it has to at least include a functional election system that is adequately resourced and professionally administered. And um, we don't give it the attention it deserves. We don't give election officials the support that they deserve. You know, do I think that's the bullet, the sort of silver bullet reform, the one reform implemented on a nationwide basis through massive federal funding? Um, I, don't, I don't know that I do. I'll tell you something else is not, I'll just throw this out here. It has no following at all. Uh, we have a system in this country where we permit partisan election officials to run elections. Secretaries of state who want to be governor or senator, or one day president or whatever it is, um, they run elections uh, and they run for office as we're seeing today with commitments they are making about the kind of election supervision that they're going to exercise. Now, I recognize it would take, there are all sorts of complications in trying to change that, but we really ought to change that. We ought not to have partisans affiliated with a particular political party who are responsible for policy setting and rulemaking in the conduct of the electoral process. It just makes no sense whatsoever. And I, untangling that's not going to be easy. 
But if I get to fantasize, I'd have to say that might be the one reform instituted nationwide that would make the most difference, which is to take partisan politics out of the administration of elections and let people who know what they're doing run it uh, the same way we want people who know what they're doing to perform medical procedures, build safe airplanes, you name it. That I think would be critical. So here is what looks to be a final question, Bob. Um, and it's about race and voting. Given that the Supreme Court recently stayed the Alabama case, it was a strong case of racial gerrymandering. What hope is there for proving Section 2 claims of the VRA going, going forward, absent congressional action? A really good and complicated question. Um, obviously, there's some people who saw in the Alabama stay um, something more than was expressed on the surface or within the confines of the written statements of the justices who voted to stay the case. That is to say, they, they, they read in it uh, that there was trouble ahead and that we would see, as we did in Brnovich versus the Democratic National Committee, a continuing narrowing of relief provided uh, that would be available under Section 2. Some people probably noticed also that in Brnovich, Justice Gorsuch put into play the whole question of whether there's a private right of action. We should assume there is indeed a private right of action under uh, the Voting Rights Act. Um, so uh, I'd have to say that um, you put the phrase absent congressional action at the end. I mean, these are gonna get thoroughly litigated, these, these cases. Uh, but uh, I am concerned about the future of the Voting Rights Act, and I wish I could give you an optimistic final sort of answer to close out the discussion, but I, I really can't at this point. I think that absent congressional action, um, there is obviously going to be Section 2 litigation, and some of it on particular facts, as the laws applied to those facts, may be successful. But as a robust remedy, um, I think that it is facing an uncertain future. Well, just to throw out a controversial thought to close this. Um, remember that Republicans have uh, always voted overwhelmingly for the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, but those were clean bills. And for their own particular reasons, the Democrats uh, included the voting rights provisions, including a fix of Section 5, in with the um, the For the People Act and their other voting bills that were really, um, while they had some good provisions, they were uh, political hijackings by the wily political operatives of the Democratic Party to gain sort of the a, a foothold in elections. And so the, the strategic era by the Democratic leadership to not provide a clean vote on VRA authorization uh, is now uh, coming back, I think, to, to haunt them a bit. Uh, and I do think it's fair to say that with this current Supreme Court, um, uh, Section 2 is going to continue to get chipped away. And the Alabama case is likely to be the next, um, the next chip uh, in Section 2. Um, so with that, uh, Donovan, Emma, let us turn it back to you. Thank you again so much for giving Bob and me the opportunity to talk about the Election Officials Legal Defense Network. And uh, we really hope many of you will uh, sign up to help out. Yes, thanks to all of you. And thanks very much for having us. Thank you both. This was excellent, excellent discussion. And we're just really privileged to have you both to end this. You're, you're just incredible leaders and very inspiring. Um, so with that, I just want to just thank everyone who participated in this, obviously Ben and Bob and everyone else who had a role in this from the the participants and the students uh, who volunteered their time over the last two days. It's just been great to see this come together. And I just want to remind everyone that we had six essay presentations during this two day symposium. Um, and those essays will be forthcoming in the Stanford Law Review online this spring. So we hope that you read them and share them and continue to pro promote this great, great work. So with that, thank you all.